Guys, we're talking about the atrial fibrillation today. This is an important topic. Usually the patients who are above 60 years of age, they are at risk of atrial fibrillation. And as the age increases, the risk increases. Patients who are people who are 80 years of age and above, 10% of them have atrial fibrillation. The other interesting thing is that sometimes patient doesn't know that they have atrial fibrillation. And it is just during some routine test or some other test, some other workup that you're doing that you end up finding out that the patient also has the atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is characterized by disorganized, rapid and irregular atrial activation. With the loss of atrial contraction, and we'll explain why, with an irregular ventricular rate which is determined by the AV nodal conduction. So keep this in mind. AV node becomes a very important uh, entity during the atrial fibrillation episodes and it will dis determine how many impulses from the atria will go to the ventricle and what will become the ventricular rate. So keeping those in mind, 120 beats per minute to 180, some books say 160 beats per minute. Now this can be varying, this can be different. For example, people who have AV nodal issues, whose AV node may not be as healthy, may not have a very high rate. Similarly, people who have vagal tone issues may not have very high rate. On the other hand, there may be that people who have other sympathetic discharges or other comorbidities, for example, hyperthyroidism, may have uh, atrial fibrillation and the ventricular rates that are greater than 200 beats per minute. So for a safe range, 120 to 160 is something that you should keep in mind. Now the question is, what is the atrial fibrillation and how does this happen? So let's look at a heart here. Let's say So in this heart, this is the right atrium. We know that superior vena cava opens in it. Inferior vena cava opens in this. We also know so this is superior vena cava. Inferior vena cava. Coronary sinus opens in it. This, on this side, is the left atrium. And we know that four pulmonary veins open up in the left wing atrium. This is important for us. And if I look at just the left ventricle, so let's say this is the left ventricle, this is the interventricular septum. I'm going to make left ventricle look like a box. And we are seeing this is the posterior aspect. This is anterior aspect. We know that pulmonary veins there are four of them that open in the left atrium. What happens is that where the, the veins, they open in that area. So let's say these are the, the veins. Of course, it is a symbolic, it's, it's a diagrammatic structure. The, this is not to to be looked at from an anatomical point of view. What is important for us is to realize that where a vein, pulmonary vein attaches with the atria, over there, there is a small sleeve of atrial muscle that projects towards the vein and makes a sleeve around it and connects with it. So if I make that over here, what happens is that atria, I'm going to make atria in red, atria muscle projects out and it connects with the 
pulmonary vein. So this sleeve here of atria or atrial muscle that projects this sleeve here of atrial muscle. This is the left atrium. This is a this blue one is the pulmonary vein coming to the atrium from the lungs. This sleeve here, the muscle cells here, the smooth muscle cells here, which are basically cardiac muscle type, these cells are the basic culprit. These are the ones that can cause, that give rise to atrial fibrillation in the first place. These are usually the source of atrial fibrillation. Eventually at our level this is sufficient to know that on the left in the left atrium it is the pulmonary vein areas or connections that is where sometimes in people extra pacemaker activity starts. This extra pacemaker activity when that happens of course what that does is that it would create electrical impulses correct. So now we know uh, let me just quickly remind you of this that we know that usually in a normal heart, SA node, SA node is the pacemaker. It is present in the right atria, atrium. It is the pacemaker. The impulses from the SA node, they go to the atria through specialized muscle fibers. All of those impulses finally always reach the AV node. AV node then through the AV bundle and then the his Purkinje system brings impulses to ventricle right so we we are aware of this this is the normal track of the impulse travel now what happens is as the impulses started getting generated in the pulmonary vein area what will happen imagine this I become 60 years and all of a sudden one day out of the blue no good reason and we'll talk about it that there can be good reasons but out of the blue what happens is there is a firing of a muscle cell out of sync with the SA node. Once that firing occurs once there is an extra pacemaker that impulse that comes in is also going to create one more extra systole. And if this continues to happen, then what will happen is that this pacemaker is now an additional pacemaker in addition to SA node. And now we have apparent activity, we have chaotic activity that is going on in the atria. And all of that, all of these impulses are going to reach the AV node. So now AV node is receiving impulses from two sources or as we call them drivers, one is the SA node itself and then there are impulses coming from those erratic ectopic foci that have developed in the left ventricle. This kind of a situation where this starts happening is usually called clinically paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or paroxysmal AF. The definition of this is that the that the fibrillation that should occur, the arrhythmia that will occur, will stay lesser than a week. Normally it will occur and then it will be restore and patient will be okay. The question that we have to answer is, what is the progression and what is the state of the atria during this time and what happens on the EKG? So let's look at that. First of all, what is the state of atrial contraction? Look, as the ectopic uh, 
as the ectopic foci start appearing in the atria, left atria especially, what will happen is that instead of unified contraction, syncytial contraction by all the atrial cells, and that means all the atrial muscle contracting together, instead of that, the atrial muscles will start independently contracting. Why? Because there are so many impulses present. Where did these impulses come from? From the pulmonary veins. So as these are present, some fibers are contracting, some fibers are relaxing. The result of that is an atria are not contracting as one unit. What is the result of that? Think about it clinically. If atria are not contracting as a unit, instead they are just quivering. That is the word we use. Quiver, quiver, or sort of shiver, or we also call it bag of worms. When that happens, remember atria contribute about 20 to 25 percent of the blood is contributed to the ventricles by atrial kick which is the atrial contraction so that atrial kick is missing does it matter for normal situations normal healthy people usually not however i hope you can understand as soon as a patient is going to be under stress or the patient is going to need to do the, do an exercise the patient is going to be missing that atrial kick and that would cause patient to become breathless, patient to have symptoms of uh, cardiovascular compromise. This also tells you clinically that the patient, when he doesn't have atrial contraction, do you think that in the jugular venous pulse, in the jugular venous pulse, the A wave, so in the JVP, the A wave will be present. This A wave is because of the atrial contraction due, during which time the pressure in the atria increases and is reflected back in the JVP measurement device. So when atria are not kicking, when atria are not contracting, A wave in the JVP will become what? It will become absent. Similarly, on the EKG, remember atrial activity is shown as P wave and then we have QRS complex T wave, right? So this is the P wave. There will be no P wave because atria are not contracting as a unit chamber. Instead, there will be either nothing, so isoelectric line is going to stay isoelectric or very fine shivering of the line which is depicting so many extra foci that are present and are active at the same time. Then the QRS complex, what do you think will happen to the QRS complex? Will the QRS complex be normal? So P wave is gone, right? What do you think about the QRS complex? Will that be normal? Is there any problem with the ventricle? No, there is no problem with the ventricle. So QRS complex will be normal or as we say, narrow QRS complexes are present. T wave, present. Further P waves, no P waves, just quivering or flat. And then once again, QRS complexes and so on. Will there be any PR segments? There anything related to P wave? No, there will be nothing. So that is your basic identifier on the EKG to see that this may be a, an atrial fibrillation. So we have a patient that does not have A wave in the JVP. That, that is a patient who has missing P waves with the normal QRS complexes. About heart sounds, remember that in some patients, So patient whose left ventricle is hypertrophied, in such patients, the left atrial kick is really important. So this is left atrium, this is left ventricle. The ventricle is hypertrophied. In such patients, the atrial kick is really important because it helps to fill the ventricle. Now imagine that this patient 
does not have the atrial kick because atria are fibrillating. Patient has atrial fibrillation. Now remember in the hypertrophy of failing heart, in both cases, the atrial kick can contribute to S4 heart sound. Right? S4 heart sound is what? It is a heart sound that is heard near the end of the diastole. Just before the ventricle decides to go in a systole, atria goes for a contraction and adds some more blood. In people with the heart failure, that extra blood, extra kick is really important and that causes a filled heart or a heart which has uh, where atria has to squeeze the blood in by force either way so either there is heart that is dilated left ventricle is dilated and it is filled with lots of fluids lot of blood not fluids it is filled with lots of blood and atria have to kick to add some more blood to it and when that blood is added that causes splatter and S4 sound or atria have to give a kick and force the extra blood to go in because there is a ventricular cavity compromise and that extra blood is needed by the body so atria has to contribute in both of those cases S4 sound may be present now if the patient has atrial fibrillation and the patient is of heart failure patient, you may not hear S4 sound. So you may not see, you will not see A wave in JVP, you will not see P wave on EKG, you will not see or hear S4 sound where you were expecting to hear the S4 sound. Now the question how is the electrical activity justified that P wave at the QRS complex and what is the rhythm of the uh, ventricles? So let's look at that. So now what happens is in this patient, as there are so many aberrant foci, ectopic foci that are active in the atria, those impulses, electrical impulses from all of them, and they're all pacing together. They're all becoming active together. They're not waiting for each other. They are all same uh, rhythm pacemakers because they are in the same tissue. So they're all creating waves that are going to the AV node. So AV node is bombarded by these waves. And what happens is it is transmitting them occasionally rather more frequently to the ventricle. So what happens is that ventricles develop an irregularly irregular uh, rhythm. What does that mean? So if you look at the, the EKG, you'll see there is a QRS complex. So what you're seeing is that there is no regularity to the irregularity. Meaning you can't say that, all right, this is a two to one type of rhythm, or this is a three to one rhythm, or this is a four to one rhythm, or the, the rhythm is 60 beats per minute, there is no regularity, so you can't really say what the actual rhythm for the ventricles is. The question is clinically what are the types of the atrial fibrillation? So, look, atrial fibrillation goes from paroxysmal, if we talk about the types, it goes from paroxysmal to persistent to permanent. What does that mean? Proxismal are usually lesser than a week. So atrial fibrillation starts and then within a, before a week is over, the fibrillation has resolved. Patient sometimes is aware of it, sometimes they are not even aware of it. This is where the problem occurs that if the patient then continues to have the issue, it can become persistent. Persistent is greater than a week. Or persistent is where you need cardioversion 
to fix it and it can be fixed in the persistent state and then there is a time when it becomes permanent permanent is when it is going on for years mostly it is not fixable even when you cardiovert the patient it does not fix so now we have to understand how does that happen so let's look at the pathology of how patient goes clinically from proximal to persistent to permanent and remember the treatment and the management all, of all of these are different and that is why it is important for you to be able to detect what is the stage or the type of the fibrillation so let's look at it let's say that this is the these are the atria and let's say these are some muscle cells cardiac muscle cell as we all know I'm just making some of them and imagine that they have branches and they are connecting and they have interconnected discs and so on i'm going to make one cardiac muscle cell cell here so let's say this is a cardiac muscle cell this is the intercalated disc right inter related disc now we know that in this cardiac muscle we have calcium channels i'm just going to make the calcium channel here so this is a calcium channel we also know that there are potassium channels we also know that there are sodium channels correct and then sodium potassium pumps and so on here is what happens look at the diagram on the left so let's say this is a pulmonary veins entrance this let's create a partition between left and right atrium pulmonary veins entrance is causing a new a new impulse to generate when that impulse is generated, what will happen is that of course we have now another area where the electrical impulse is coming in from. So the muscle cells near that impulse area are going to start contracting. So if I make those muscle cells, let's say these are the contracted muscle cells. While the muscle cells a little away, so let's say these are the contracted muscle cells from here little bit away over here muscle cells are still relaxed why because they have no electrical activity and imagine that SA node is in diastolic phase or it is in resting phase and it is it has not sent an activity yet so that means majority of the atria was actually just sitting not contracting while a bunch of cells in the left atria started contracting. Can I make one more cell right next to these tiny cells here and imagine that this cell, this cell, let's call it cell A, cell A did not receive the impulse. While the, the cluster of cells that are B cells, let's call them B cluster, that has contracted. Can I say that the connective tissue between these cells is going to become stretched because part of the cells are contracting, some cells are contracting and others are not. Remember when atria contract or when ventricles contract, all of them, all of the cells contract together and all of them relax together. But if this is a situation where some cells are contracting while others are still relaxed. That would cause shearing effect of the connective tissue that is joining these cells together can i say that when this continue to happen when this happens repeatedly then the cells here the connective tissue here is going to start becoming damaged and the cells will start becoming 
So um, if I make this one here, the cell, this big cell, now has damage on this side and it is all sad. And similarly, the smaller cells have damage on this side and they're all sad as well. So this damage is going to result in what? It is going to result in So fibroblasts will proliferate here as a result of inflammation. Collagen will be laid in this area because of inflammatory reaction. Now both of these structures, the fibroblasts are electrically active. Collagen also disrupts the electrical activity. The result of this is that these areas will become either facilitator of electrical activities or disruptor of the electrical activities and all of a sudden we might develop a re-entrant circuit here. This is called cardiac remodeling as a result of the fibrillation. And here is what is really important. As this remodeling occurs, and as a re-entry circuit develops, do you think that this circuit by itself will stop working? No. This circuit has now developed a structure. This area has developed a structure that will facilitate re-entry because of the damage here and because of electrically active fibroblasts and other things. When this fibrillation continues for a longer period of time, more than a year, for example, there will be so many areas in the atria that will have fibroblasts proliferated, that will have collagen laid down, and that would develop re-entrant circuits in there, which will trap the impulse and become foci of electrical activity. Do you think that such a patient can be cured by just cardioverting or by stopping the fibrillation? No. You stop the fibrillation and as soon as the next impulse comes in, that impulse is going to get trapped into this re-entrant circuit, re circuit and it is going to start fibrillating again. And imagine hundreds of such circuits present. So this is one mechanism of cardiac remodeling, moving the patient from proximal atrial fibrillation toward persistent atrial fibrillation because there is structural remodeling. Now let's look at ionic channel or cellular remodeling. So in that what happens is, Look at this cell here. This cell here, when it is activated again and again, what is the end result? When the atrial cell has become rapidly active, wouldn't that cause lots of calcium to come in? Remember, whenever the muscle contracts, whenever the action potential comes in, Calcium comes in and deposits. When there is more and more calcium, the cell will say, Oh man, I am contracting so much and I am working so rapidly and I have gotten so much calcium in. What do I need to do? I need to down-regulate my calcium channels. So when the calcium channels are down-regulated, the number of calcium channels on the cell have reduced in their count. This is actually a protective mechanism by the cell. But now think about it. When the cell has a fewer number of calcium channels, if you cardiovert such a patient, if you fix the fibrillation, either through drugs or through electrical shock, the patient's, this cell has less calcium channels. That means their action potential duration 
is going to become reduced because we know that in cardiac cells the plateau of the action potential is maintained by calcium movement and as there is not many calcium channels calcium will not move that easily or that much in quantity and the result is that the APD duration action potential duration APD will reduce and you know whenever the action potential duration reduces whenever the cell is firing faster having a faster action potential that will mean this cell will become prone to repeated firing and that is another case where the cell has become remodeled to participate in fibrillation or to participate in repeated stimuli quickly this is remodeling at cellular level we also saw remodeling at structural or cardiac muscle cell level now also let's look at a situation where instead of a remodeling a failing heart enables the um, arrhythmias so how does that work we know that let's say the patient has dilating left ventricle left ventricular failure is occurring the ventricle is dilating that means atrial muscles are also stretching and we know that when the muscle cells are stretched so let's say this was the we have discussed this in the re-entry let's say this was a normal cyclic circuit of muscle cells cardiac muscle cells and when the impulse starts from one cell and continues to go to the next cells by the time impulse reaches back to the first cell that cell is in a refractory state and the impulse dies and that is how re-entry is prevented but when there is dilatation as is the situation here then what we have is we have a stretched out path of the muscle cells and now when the impulse goes from cell 1 to 2 to 3 it is covering a longer distance and while it is traveling the previous cell let's say this one here has become non-refractory it has taken the impulse has taken long enough to come back that the cell has become ready for the next impulse and the re-entry will occur so this is one of the causes of atrial fibrillation which is the ventricular failure or uh, dilate, dilatation of the heart. So this is one, um, you know, cardiac failure. Then ischemia or ischemic injury of the heart. So imagine that we have cardiac injury in this area. There is ischemia. What will ischemia do? What ischemia does is that the channels the sodium channel the potassium channel the, the calcium channels these channels can become altered during the ischemic injury and if for during that alteration sodium channels are are irritated or calcium channels are reduced or damaged the result of that can become that the action potential duration will become less so we have done two things here just keep in mind we have talked about the fibrillation caused by dilated heart and damaged heart and then fibrillation giving rise to from proximal to persistent fibrillation by giving rise to generation of new remodeled pathways that will act as foci so now in these patients who have gone into persistence if you give them cardioversion and if they do not have enough damage done they can then be reversed and the sinus rhythm can be restored however permanent is when there is enough remodeling that has happened 
that when you cardiovert the patient either with drugs or by electrical shock and as soon as the normal sinus rhythm is resumed as soon as the new impulses come back the the re-entrant circuits that have developed would start acting again and the patient would develop fibrillation immediately. Now let's look at the clinical um, signs and symptoms. So clinical side, what is the presentation? Look the patient may have no symptoms. And this is where actually it is bad because if the patient does not have any symptoms and the fibrillation persists for years, that would cause enough remodeling without any symptoms that you cannot cardiovert such a patient easily. No symptom. Two, of course, breathlessness. Breathlessness. Two, chest pain, discomfort, two, it can actually cause cardiac failure. Why? By repeatedly sending impulses to ventricle and by overdriving the ventricle, it can exacerbate a patient who may already be in cardiac failure. Now, remember this, that there are two more things, that is dizziness and syncope. These are not the direct effect of the atrial fibrillation. Instead, when the patient is in the fibrillation and then, let's say the fibrillation type, the stage is proxismal, and so patient goes from fibrillation spell back to sinus rhythm. When that rhythm is resumed, normal rhythm is resumed, heart will go from a, from a tachycardiac stage to a reduced um, rhythm, re reduced uh, rate. And that would cause, for a very short period of time, reduced cardiac output. And that would cause dizziness, lightheadedness, and syncope, and or syncope. So these are the uh, clinical presentations. Of course, palpitation. Palpitations are very important. Of course, uh, tachycardia. Will be present as well. Now, how do you, what is the risk of atrial fibrillation? Let's say you have a patient and you say, you know what, patient has the atrial fibrillation. So what, let's just leave it like that. So what is the risk of the fibrillation? Look, there are multiple risks. For example, as we just saw that the cardiac failure can become exacerbated. So it can enhance or accelerate the heart failure. But more importantly, in the right, sorry, in the left atrium, in the appendage of the left atrium, so let's, let's say this is the left atrium, and this here is the oracle, oracle of the left atrium, this is the left atrium, this is right atrium, and let's say this is the remaining heart. In the oracle of the left atrium, within about 48 hours, patient can develop, develop enough blood pooling that a thrombus forms. Remember that blood clotting occurs very fast, right? If you have an injury, the blood should, in normal healthy person, the blood should clot very fast. So similarly here, the blood is not exactly stopped, but because atria are not contracting, they are just quivering or shivering, the blood is, uh, blood has spaces, blood is moving slow. And that slow moving blood, and it is really venous kind of blood, will develop a 
venous kind of thrombus. I know that this is oxygenated blood coming to the left atria. A venous like thrombus will appear or can appear in the in the auricle of the left atrium. From this thrombus, the risk is that an embolus will break off, go to the left ventricle, go to brain, and cause stroke. So that is the major risk factor. Now, let's say you receive a patient. You see that the patient is in atrial fibrillation. You do an EKG and the EKG shows atrial fibrillation. You ask the patient if he knows or she knows that she or he has the atrial fibrillation and they say no. In such a case, you cannot cardiovert the patient. You cannot try to fix and stop the fibrillation because you do not know the duration through which the fibrillation has been occurring and if a thrombus is present or not. Usually, thrombus formation risk increases as, as the hours pass. Below 24 hours, you can take the risk of cardioverting. We hope that at that time, usually the thrombus is not formed, so embolism may not be there, will not be there. But as the time continues to increase, you have to make sure that you do not cardiovert the patient without first ruling out the chance of an embolism. So what do you do? Let's talk about the treatment of the patients who have been presented with the atrial fibrillation. So look, we have to give anticoagulants. So of course, warfarin like products used to be given in the past, they are still used. However, newer anticoagulants which are anti-thrombin thrombin or factor 10A are given and these have lesser risk of bleeding compared to warfarin plus the monitoring is not needed as we need that with the warfarin. So please remember this, antiplatelets do not have a lot of uh, benefit in this situation. You can give beta blockers but think about it for a second always always whenever you you're approaching the atrial fibrillation think about the stage of the patient's fibrillation if the patient is in proximal stage you may be able to give beta blockers and sort of reduce the av nodal activity and hopefully reduce the rate and rhythm and sort of control the rhythm. So there is rate control and rhythm control and anticoagulation that we have to do. So beta blockers can be given, calcium channel blockers can be given. However, once the patient has moved from proximal towards uh, persistent, there is so much remodeling that is happening that the chances of recurring have increased because the remodeled areas have a high propensity to trap an impulse and become re-entrant. Similarly, if a patient is in cardiac failure and you and the cardiac failure is not progressing well, meaning it is not slow enough, then that failure itself would continue to precipitate the atrial fibrillation. So beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, or card or pharmacological uh, therapies are not very uh, promising they do work but eventually patient is going to move from the um, from the persistent to permanent and once the permanent uh, situation occurs then what we need to do is we need to do catheter catheter ablation So what happens in that is that if we have, if I draw the atria here, let's say what we do is, these are the pulmonary veins, we insert a catheter and we ablate the tissue around the pulmonary veins. This is especially useful when patient is in proximal stage 
because the re-entrant and remodeled structures have not formed yet. And so the impulses are still generated, but they are trapped in this ablated tissue and they die there and the rest of the atria can start working normally. This is especially important when the patient feels that they do not, they, they're not comfortable handling the symptoms of the fibrillation. If the remodeling has become so widespread that just separating out the areas near the, the pulmonary veins is not sufficient, then what happens is that one can do a different kind of ablation where the, a, a pathway for the impulse travel is formed like a maze in the, in the atrial tissue and that pathway is then traced by ablating. So then we are hoping in such cases that impulse will just travel through that pathway and not spill over into the other parts of the atrial tissue and hopefully atrial fibrillation will not occur. Now going back to the, to the therapies here, remember that if you receive a patient and you do not know that the patient has um, how long the patient has had the atrial fibrillation. In such a patients, you have two choices to treat them. The first choice of the treatment is that you give for four weeks, administer anticoagulants, and then do the cardioversion, which can be by medicines or which can be done by electrical um, shock. That is one choice for you to manage the patient. Second choice is to do a transesophageal ultrasound. So do a transesophageal ultrasound and then if the report says that there is no thrombus, that is when you can proceed with anticoagulants and cardioversion and then move on with the, with the rest of the approach. So these are the two choices that are available uh, for, uh, for situations where either you know that the duration is less than 48 hours or 24 hours or you know that there is no, um, the duration is bigger but you need to figure it out the thrombus itself. Antiarrhythmic drugs can also be used. However, one must be very careful that these drugs can cause side effects that may not be good. So class one antiarrhythmic drugs can be used. These drugs have a useful action. These are sodium channel blocking agents. However, please remember that these are negatively inotropic and prorhythmic drugs. And these should be avoided if the patient has any coronary artery disease. Class 3 agents can also be uh, used. In those class 3 agents, uh, these can be administered to the patients with a coronary artery disease. However, there is 3% risk of dosage D pointes. So that is atrial fibrillation. Let us now look at the couple of EKGs that are related to that show atrial fibrillation. So look at this EKG. Here, what we have is, if you notice, P waves here are sort of just quivering and shivering and there is no pattern to the P wave, number one. Number two, this is really important. See, there is no regularity in the irregularity of the rhythm. This is what is irregularly irregular. I might say that here, the rhythm seems to be, so two boxes here, so about 150 beats per minute. But you know that rhythm here is different and rhythm here is about similar. Here it is different again, here different. So you do not have a regular pattern that you can be uh, looking at. This EKG down here is sinus rhythm, just for comparison's sake. Let's look at one more EKG. 
So in this EKG, if you see, this is also T wave. If you look at the look at the QRS complexes, and I think you can understand that as soon as you see them, there is no pattern, there is no regularity. There is no regularity. There is no pattern between the QRS complexes. So this is what is the irregularly irregular pattern. And if you look at the P wave, P wave is just simply not present. Here there is no P waves. Here we may have a shivering baseline that we can look at. So that is the kind of EKG with which you will see. Thank you very much.